December, Ann for self from the name the date. And we sat down and realized that we had a situation that was widespread, that went well beyond um, individual conflict that was important to deal with. And I sat down with Melissa, what are our options? What do the women want? Most of the women wanted a situation where the men could learn and they could all live together. So she told me, but I knew we were doing our town camp, but you know, nothing ever reached my level because it was being managed appropriately. Right? So I didn't really know about it. And what is this? So she explained, I said, okay, that sounds, that sounds meaningless, so let's give her a go. What does it look like? So I learned through the dentistry process. Um, so I'm not speaking from any experience at all. <coughs> not as a person with these wonderful people, but Jake has mentioned. As everybody has mentioned so far, traditional processes do not work in the university environment. They don't serve it well in all situations. Uh, in positioning complainants against respondents, they allow little room for the full appreciation of the context within which the behaviors are taking place, as people have mentioned. And as somebody who carries the institutional head around them, in my view, they also marginalize the university's role to that of the keeper of the process rather than an active participant in helping the community shape the culture and environment that they um, want to create. Educational or formative outcomes tend to be respondent focused, not community focused. Situations involving multiple respondents, such as one face, can lead to multiple proceedings, multiple outcomes. And They can also lead to delays and the likelihood of conflicting outcomes. This means that the universities are missing incredible opportunities, incredible teaching moments to lead their communities in shaping the working and learning environment. At Dalhousie, at the time, in December 2014, we were lucky enough, lucky enough, that our policies allowed for a very broad, flexible range of informal resolutions. So we were able to, and face the Facebook incident, wedge restorative justice we were then able to link that process with the professionalism and academic progression uh, process through the faculty, which enabled the RJ report and the outcomes, individual outcomes from the restorative process to be incorporated as part of a professional remediation. That is what enabled, with, that was the structure within which we were able to create a safe place for the good work of Jen. So obviously, out of this challenge, but how, what do we do with this challenge that faced us at the end? What came out of the ashes? I'd like to say at the Phoenix. But we faced a lot of internal opposition at Dalhousie to the, to the restorative justice process. It was not widely expected, accepted. I'd say it's more like a, a battered seagull striving to be a Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> One of our biggest challenges, actually, during the process to step back a bit is it wasn't widely understood. Uh, Minister Whalen talked about having having ele an elevator pitch. Well, it was even hard for us to come up with speaking speaking notes, talking points. Very theoretical, very difficult for people to understand, so it made it hard for us to explain the work. So what are we doing at Dow since then? Um, I'm just going to share a little bit of what our next steps are from a policy framework. Um, we've decided to put together a team of people um, comprising academics from the law, health professions, sociology, probably missing some management, some diversity experts, administrators with tremendous experience, students. And we've decided to take apart all of our behavioral policies. <coughs> Most universities will have sexual harassment policies, anti-discrimination policies, sexual assault policies, codes of student conduct. We've decided to get together and create an overriding policy or an overarching policy, where the university sets out expectations of its community members. Because at the end of the day, universities are communities, as faculty, staff, and students are as citizens. I think as an institution, we have a responsibility to set out what we expect our citizens to do and how we expect them to conduct themselves. So our vision is that this policy would cover faculty, staff, students, contractors, anybody on our campus. And that this, uh, this policy would articulate, <laughs> this policy would articulate, would, be, would outline a foundation of principles that we, everybody in this room would agree with. And some that we've started to develop, and others that we're still, we're still working on the list. Diversity, inclusiveness, care, respect, dignity, cultural competence, substantive equality. 
we think by setting these community standards, we will establish a baseline within which other processes can be developed. And then from a very boring policy framework, we would then outline in a series of procedures different options. At this point in our lives, we'll never be able to get away, or at this point, we'll never be able to eliminate the rights-based adversarial options. Sometimes it's the only way we can go, particularly if you're trying to exit someone from the university. But we think within that, we'll be able to create a range of options, not relegated to informal resolution, or formal, or some kind of hierarchy of resolution, but an array of possible processes based on restorative principles. The details of that we've not worked out, and again, speaking for myself, not the group that's developing the policy. Um, I think the policy itself has to serve as an educative tool about restorative processes, because just talking about it, people just blaze over, they just think it circles in a baton or something, they don't really focus on it at all. I have to admit, when I first met Jen, and she was telling me about it, I don't know, what do you do? I, mean, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but we're fine. What do you say to each other about this? Now I have a slightly better understanding. <laughs> People are mostly in that place, and we have to educate everybody in the university community about this. So one thing that I think is critical is without figuring out which options a particular situation um, calls for, first of all, the university should be the decision maker from that, which may sound a bit, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, the factors, in outlining the factors, people will learn to understand why they need to restore justice. So they would be things that everybody in this room knows about. What are the needs of the victim? What, what are the circumstances of the wrongdoer? What is their relationship to each other? Are the students living in residence? Is it faculty, faculty versus student? Who else in the community might be impacted? How serious is the behavior? Um, what's the nature of the harm caused? All of the, does the alleged wrongdoer take responsibility? Does the victim want to participate? All of those things that everybody in this room knows are the important elements of restorative justice. But by articulating those in a policy, people will finally understand why you care, why you're doing what you're doing. And I think it's in, in my perspective is that it's important that the institution take that role and lead that. It doesn't mean administration. It means that somebody in the institution says, okay, I'm going to look at these factors, I'm going to work in a, in a a safe environment um, with the people affected to try to figure out what the process is. So my view is an initial assessment should be undertaken in relation to that. Should be that information necessary to understand the various factors should be done on a without prejudice basis so that you can be used in an informal proceeding if it goes that route. Um,